All right, so thank you all for coming and thank you, Adrian, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so as mentioned, yes, I am a part of a, a large and diverse group of um, students and faculty, a faculty member working on this project. Uh, so the project is called Problematizing the Native Speaker in Psycholinguistics, and for our talk more broadly in psychology, uh, replacing vague and harmful terminology with inclusive and accurate measures. Okay. Apparently not. There we go. So just kind of for some background, um, where this came from and where we're hopefully going. So this started off as a fall 2020 course uh, led by uh, Savi, where we uh, were talking about problematizing the native speaker in linguistics research. And now we've kind of taken that and uh, a couple of groups have come, in out, have come out of it, looking at different aspects of it. And we are hoping to uh, submit a paper to a frontier special issue. And the special issue is the notion of the native speaker put to the test recent research advances. And actually, uh, Julie Boland was the one who recommended this avenue for us. So thank you, Julie. Um, as such, this is still a manuscript and like a work in progress. And so we're looking for feedback, recommendations, suggestions. Um, and at the end, we're hoping to save some time to kind of have a discussion about like what are the next steps, both in terms of psychology and for like our recommendations for uh, psychology and psycholinguistics. So just a roadmap of what this talk is going to look like. First, I'm going to talk about the problem. So how is it harmful? How is it vague? How is this relevant to psychology? Um, why should we care, essentially? And then uh, some rec very uh, both like concrete recommendations and also kind of some recommendations to like step back and like sit and think for a moment. OK, so why and how is native speaker or signer problematic? So we have seen native speaker or signer and nativeness associated with a laundry list of terms that uh, don't all have a great connotation or um, even just definition, right? So uh, an association. So native speaker and signer has been associated with hegemonic monolingualism. It's been associated with a monoglot standard. And oftentimes these spouse uh, a deficit model, model towards mon uh, multilingualism. So this is really, uh, we see a lot of times that this monolingual native speaker is put on a pedestal and that everyone else, any other type of speaker is not that and not enough, right? Um, nativeness has also been associated with whiteness. And we see this very closely tied to who we just deem is qualified to teach uh, English, for example. Um, and so there's this ideology, especially within English language teaching about who is qualified to teach English. We also see this come up in ideologies of languagelessness. So people who identify as not having a language because of these uh, uh, assumptions that uh, other people basically impose on them and the assumptions that they feel that they're supposed to have about uh, their language. We also see uh, nativeness and native a uh, signer or speaker has been associated with essentialism or like authenticity. So perceived authenticity, who can be a native speaker of a language who doesn't count. Um, and oftentimes these are imposed by outsiders as opposed to like the individual person speaking. Um, it's also been associated with purism. So this idea of like the pure native language or like the pure monolingual speaker. And so none of these are really great associations. And so we hope that we can move away from this and we'll give some recommendations as to how. Okay. So how, uh, this is kind of just like a pause for reflection or you guys are welcome to like, kind of like send it in the chat or unmute yourself and just kind of like mention very quickly, maybe like an aspect, how would you define native speaker? Seems like there's some comments in in the chat, like maybe speaking a language that uh, is dominant in a country or someone's first language. For some suggestions. Okay, great. So we have two different aspects of language already. Um, yeah. Okay. So I hope uh, hopefully everyone had like a moment to think. Maybe they have their own opinions about like what this entails, or probably you guys came up with uh, in your head like a list of things that a native speaker is or is not. Um, and so we'll kind of keep those in mind as we move forward in this presentation. So that kind of leads nicely into uh, this table that I have here. It's a little overwhelming, and that's actually the point of this table. So oftentimes in language research, we see that native speaker is not defined. And in the rare cases that it is defined, we get definitions like this. Um, and so 
I, I, I bolded the parts that kind of uh, seem to be the themes or that the main points of the definition. So for example, uh, in Ben Mamoun, they talk about uh, define a native speaker as uh, someone who lives in a monolingual environment. Um, they, their original native language has not undergone attrition. Um, they are expected to have a native-like pronunciation and like a sizable comprehensive vocabulary. And they do actually um, operationalize what that means uh, in this case. Then we can also see that in other cases, people say that language is acquired from a naturalistic exposure. Uh, it's in, the acquisition was in early childhood uh, in an authentic social context or speech community. Uh, Bolt, Boltova um, said that this is from denotes membership, not fluency. So now we see a different aspect of language experience that uh, seems to evoke an idea of identity as opposed to a language um, like production or comprehension. Uh, Abrahamson and Kjeltenstam uh, say this was a study done specifically with Swedish speakers. So Swedish, uh, these native speakers had to have only spoken Swedish at home during childhood. Um, and Swedish was the only language of instruction at school and that this individual had to live their whole life in a context in which Swedish was the majority language. Um, and so we can kind of see to um, Pam's comment where like speaking the language dominant in the country, this might relate to the Abrahamson definition. Uh, and we see first language throughout a number of these definitions here. But we can also see that this is a wide array of definitions and they don't all correspond. And so if we're trying to study bilinguals or monolinguals or just some sort of idea of what a native speaker is, we don't have very good consistency across who we can count or don't count as a native speaker. And so a number of uh, concepts that native speaker has been defined by um, has been identity or allegiance, uh, exposure or the use of the language. So this could be like the context of acquisition. So age, order, um, dominance, or the amount of exposure and use of a language. It could be behavior. So this could be uh, someone's vocabulary, their reaction times to like sentence verification tasks or a lexical decision task. Um, so, or, or similarity in production or processing stages, um, strategies between native versus non-native speakers, and then also perceived nativeness, right? So if we have the, all of these definitions uh, that aren't consistent across studies, then really what we're seeing is that it's an experimenter's idea of who is native speaker. Um, and so there's this idea of a perceived nativeness of a speaker, especially when this now can relate to things like um, race and who can like teach or give judgments on language. Okay, so and here are just some potential problems that we have identified with these different operaliz operation operationalizations that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these right now. I'll just go through um, so exposure and use, for example. I'll just go through kind of like what are some of the problems that can be associated with this. Um, so in terms of exposure and use, we oftentimes um, conceptualize, or when we then go to analyze our data, we base, or even in our recruitment, we have cutoffs. So we say, well, someone has to be a native speaker, and then if they don't have a certain proficiency, they're not a native speaker. Or when we go and analyze our data, we categorize native versus non-native speaker. Uh, and so what are these cutoffs based on? And do certain norms, some of our assumptions, do these exclude entire communities? Uh, so for example, who are we considering a native speaker? If a participant uh, anticipates or interprets native speaker to be more uh, an identity marker as opposed to um, a language usage, uh, then who are we excluding from this? And why, and so, and then also in our recruitment, we might not be recruiting the same participants that we are actually trying to target. Uh, how do our questions reinforce the de deficit perspectives? Um, and then how do measures, especially proficiency measures, uh, compare? So these are just some of the issues that we get just within exposure and use in operationalizing nativeness in terms of exposure and use. And you can see that we have issues with all of the operationalizations uh, that were mentioned on the previous slide. Okay. And a lot of times these inconsistencies uh, could result in problems for replicability. And so I'm sure you all heard of the replication crisis in psychology and how uh, we're really struggling in order to establish that our field is doing good science and is putting forth like if uh, good science and moving the field forward, right? 
And so if we're basing our constructs off of something that's ill-defined and our variables are not well operationalized, then we're simply contributing to this issue. Um, so for example, in recruitment, as I already mentioned, oftentimes we don't know how the participants are interpreting native speaker. It is possible to know this, um, and we'll get into uh, how to know this later uh, in the recommendations. Uh, but for a lot of the past work, we don't know how participants are interpreting native speaker and whether or not uh, they're interpreting it in the same way as that was experimenters are intending it. Um, and so this inconsistency, um, is oftentimes native speaker is not defined, as I mentioned, and even when it is, there's large inconsistencies across the board. Um, and it's used as a proxy for other measures, right? So all of those aspects are just different aspects of language experience. And so grouping them all under this, the very broad term of native speaker uh, doesn't help us here. And in data analysis, um, oftentimes we assume that there's homogeneity within a uh, monolingual or even this group of native speakers. And we see that there's been a number of studies that have looked at, um, say, like, um, judgments of different grammatical cons uh, constructions in monolinguals. And there is large differences between monolinguals within language research. And so this assumption that we're coming in that uh, monolinguals are a homogenous group is incorrect. Okay, so coming out from all of this, one of our main points is that nativeness is an ill-defined essentialist construct and that we need to move past this and use more inclusive terminology. Okay, and we've also seen that in our sibling fields, there's a robust tradition and practice of actually like sitting down and thinking about this and thinking about like, well, how is this helping us or in most cases not helping us and what can we do instead? And so we've seen this in linguistic anthropology, we've seen it in uh, ELT, educational linguistics, and especially in second language acquisition. Um, <clears throat> and so these, we are encouraging our fields as psychologists to move forward and also join our fields. Um, and I'm sorry, excuse me, also think about this, problematize it, and come up with a solution. Okay, so how is this construct used in psychological methods? So we've already gone over a little bit of it, but I'm gonna go a little bit more into the details now. So in recruitment, oftentimes, even if you don't study language explicitly, maybe you just want to recruit uh, speakers or you just want to recruit people who live in the US. Uh, oftentimes, even just for general psychology um, studies, there's just a question that says, are you a native English speaker, right? Um, and so even in recruitment, that's not for language studies, we see this issue crop up. Um, and so we often use this uh, I guess like a heuristic essentially to try and get participants who fit a desired profile, right? We have some sort of um, assumption that uh, native speakers have some sort of shared social experience. Uh, there's a perceived uh, homogeneity among these speakers, right? And then in language research, for uh, in especially what we're looking for usually is a particular language profile and a similar language experience. So this crops up both in like psycholinguistics, language research, as well as more general psych research. And how does this kind of compare or crop up in our research questions? So we often compare native to non-native speakers, and this can um, be conceptualized in questions such as how do different types of uh, language exposure or uh, affect learning or attainment? Uh, how are non-native speakers perceived by native speakers and non-native speakers? How is non-native speech processed by native speakers and non-native speakers? Um, and when we then when this translates into our analysis, we often group native and non-native speakers and do between group analysis. Um, and again, this comes with the assumption of within group homogeneity. So, some of the issues that come up with this and some of the things that we hope for you to uh, think about is that when we ask the question something like, are you a native uh, speaker of English? Who are we excluding when we try to recruit like this? So how is this term understood by the participants? Does it actually target what we as the researchers really care about? So do we actually care about native speaker of English or are we more interested in a specific aspect of language experience? Um, and if so, it's probably better to ask about that specific aspect of language experience 
than this very broad term that can encompass many things. Um, in terms of research questions, uh, oftentimes when we compare native speakers to non-native speakers, it's a very slippery slope to then espousing deficit perspectives, right? It's very easy to say, oh, if native speakers do this and non-native speakers don't do this, it's because they don't have native-like proficiency, right? And so we're already automatically just assigning them some sort of lesser status. And so we need to be very careful when we're thinking about how we're designing our questions and our experiments uh, to not use deficit models. And oftentimes we, can, we don't properly theorize perceived nativeness within these contexts. Similarly, an analysis, um, we often assume some sort of common center um, and then there are deviations from this group. And so we've already decided kind of what these groups are. Um, and we don't actually look at like, maybe what are the groups that are inherent in the data that we're getting, right? Um, okay. So we've gone over the issues, we've gone over how this is relevant to psychology. So now we're really gonna get into like the meat of what can we do? Um, so recommendations for psychologists who collect language information, but don't study it. I do wanna say there are things that you guys can do and we hope that you do that. So first of all, think about whether or not you actually need to collect this information. Even if you're just collecting it for demographic information, think about whether or not that is required and really necessary for your study. Um, if you do feel like you do need some sort of language information for your study, uh, even if it's just demographic information, we ask you to not use the term native speaker. Instead, try and think about the aspect of language experience that is relevant or that might be more informative than just using native speaker and use that instead. And again, don't assume homogeneity. For psychologists who study language, we have a lot of suggestions. Um, and this is where really where we're looking for feedback and kind of like, where, what are we still missing? Um, and what are also like next steps we can take? So overarching recommendations are really just be explicit and specific. So be explicit about the types of language use, experience, allegiance, and identity, which are relevant for your research questions and for your theoretical stance as a whole. Um, and so think about this also in terms of what's relevant for the social context of your participants. Um, so for example, if a participant is going to if you're in a context where your participants uh, identify with a native language based off of as an identity marker, as opposed to some sort of uh, language proficiency or use, you need to be aware of that and want, want to maintain this sort of trust uh, and relationship with the community that you're working with. Also operationalize your variables within the context of your formal uh, or verbal theory. So whatever your stance is, uh, make sure you understand what the, the assumptions of those theories are in terms of native speaker. Um, and then think about what aspects of language experience are important for this theory or for this your theoretical stance. All right, that's really vague, right? So what can we actually do that's more specific, more helpful? So in terms of first, what we'd recommend is for you just take a step back and kind of just reflect um, on these questions so you can kind of figure out like, what do you need to do uh, when in design or recruitment or analysis? It's going to take a little bit of thinking uh, in order to get there. Just like when you're designing an experiment, you need to sit and think like how, what's the best way to operationalize this variable? This is the same thing that we're recommending here. So reflect on your own assumptions about native speakers. What does it mean to you? If you can write out a list of what a native speaker is to you, then you can probably identify the aspects of language experience that are important for your research. And that's then going to influence how you design and operationalize your uh, experiment. And then also think about like what theories regarding language experience do you support? Why do you support them? Are they deficit models? Maybe reconsider and think about why are you supporting a deficit model and is this actually benefiting um, both your, uh, the community that you're researching and also uh, the research as a whole. And then also think about would including speakers with a different language profile affect your predictions anyway, and why? If you can think about how a speaker with a different profile might impact your data, then maybe that difference gives an insight into how uh, that aspect of language is important for the theory, right? Um, and then 
More generally, just what aspects of language use and experience and allegiance, identity are important for your research questions, so not just for your theoretical stance, but also for your specific research questions, and then also why. So once you've done this reflection, you'll be well suited to then move on and design your experiment. So again, here be explicit about the aspects of language that you're interested in. Instead of using something like, oh, native speaker, you can look at, okay, I'm really interested in age of acquisition. I'm interested in context of acquisition. I'm interested in uh, current proficiency, or I'm interested in dominance. Even if you're looking at proficiency, there's some, um, some issues about how proficiency measures compare. So make sure that you uh, understand those, as, those issues as well. Um, make sure you also understand how this is going to be interpreted in the local context, right? So again, um, how is it going to be interpreted by your participants? So really getting to know your community and establishing a relationship with them. Choose and define your comparison groups carefully. And even better, try to not make comparison groups. So we'll get into a little bit more in the analysis group. But if you can avoid dividing your participants into group we, groups, we really recommend that. And again, try to avoid uh, deficit perspectives. And so here are just some questions. I'm not going to go through them right now. Um, but uh, I will, I'm will. i happy to share these slides afterwards as well as like a PDF file so that, um, great. Um, so that everyone has these and has access and also can refer back to it throughout their stages of research um, as to like the questions that we can ask in order to help operationalize our variables. So like, why is this aspect of language research important? What predictions does it make? Um, how would a different uh, speaker profile impact my data? Um, who am I excluding from my research? So these are the types of questions that we should be asking at almost every stage uh, of our research. And so the, really the end goal of these, this series of questions is what aspect of language experience is important for this, experience, uh, for this experiment and what does my design imply about language experience? In terms of uh, recruitment, so you can, your goal could either be to collect data from a specific population of interest, or it could be to approximate just relative, homo, uh, relative homogeneity within your sample, right? Um, and so again, here we caution against assuming homogeneity just based off of a term like native speaker or monolingual. Um, and so it's important to recruit and characterize your participants carefully and explicitly. And on the next slide, we have some examples of how to do this. So once you've determined what aspect of language is really important for your research, so this would be identified in this uh, factor of interest column. So this could be age of acquisition, order of acquisition, context, language usage practices, language identity and allegiance. This is not exhaustive. Uh, this is just some examples. We have some categorical questions that might be more beneficial during recruitment, right? So this is a yes or no. Um, and questions so that you can get people who fit your idea of or your target population, right? So then you could say for age of acquisition, uh, your uh, recruitment question could be, did you start learning English before the age of seven, right? If that's what you're interested in, then you can ask that. Participants who say yes, they're eligible for your study. Participants who say no, they're not eligible for your study. We then also encourage you to ask continuous questions in uh, your surveys of language experience. Once you've recruited these uh, participants, we encourage you to ask more fine-grained, uh, open-ended questions that get more into their language experience. So you can start asking, at what age did you begin learning X? Uh, so in this case, English. Um, and so this could also, we have some options of like consider probing different aspects of this language experience. Um, and you may also want to ask, even if your recruitment might be based on the age of acquisition, you may also during your language uh, experience survey want to ask about all of the other um, language experiences so that you have a complete profile of this speaker. Okay. In your analysis, what we really recommend is to collect continuous measures of language experience and then to con uh, conserve these continuous uh, variables in your analysis and to um, run models that have continuous predictors. So you might run a linear model. Um, so as opposed to like a t-test or an ANOVA, you might wanna do a linear model. 
um, you might want to start looking at individual differences to see how uh, people's experience and other factors uh, impact uh, whatever aspect of language you're studying. And then uh, some other options that you might want to look at are principal components analysis. So this could help you infer what aspects of language or background experience are relevant to your research. And you can also look at multidimensional scaling. So this can help group your data based off of like what's actually the groups that are in the data as opposed to these uh, superimposed groups that you have created. Um, we are not statisticians. And so we will refer you to Young 2016 for questions about um, using continuous versus or using categorical data, uh, oh, treating continuous variables as categorical. Um, and so it's very well explained in that paper. And so if you have questions about that, I would recommend looking there. Um, okay. So our main take home from this is that really, we believe that nativeness is better thought of as an ideology as opposed to an idealization. An idealization assumes that there is something to be measured. There is nativeness to be measured. You could be more or less native and this can be measured in some concrete way. Ideology is more that when we're asking about nativeness, we're asking about the ideologies of nativeness. We're asking about like, what does the, uh, the subject or the experimenter think about nativeness? What do they associate with nativeness? And so what we're really pushing towards is to treat nativeness more as an ideology as opposed to an idealization. And so in the end, in our opinion, nativeness isn't worth it. And we hope that you will agree with us. Um, and nativeness comes with its connection with uh, about like language, who is able to speak, who counts as a native speaker. Oftentimes this doesn't line up with the, what the subject thinks. Um, it's tied to race and ethnicity. It's um, uh, tied also to a lot of like colonialism um, and um, classism. Sorry, I was looking for the word. Um, and it has the potential to do a lot of uh, harm and it already has done a lot of harm as we've seen in a number of the papers we read. Um, and so also, just in terms of like who gets to have intuitions or give judgments about language is often racialized. Um, and so, and that's not something that we want to continue within our field. And so it doesn't seem like this is really what we're going for as psychologists. So there might be some people who are looking at like, well, how is language racialized? That's a different question. But for the most part, how we're using native speaker in psychology, this is not our intention. Um, and so what we're hoping is that we can move forward and use more uh, inclusive terms um, and more well-defined terms as well, both so that we can benefit the community through research, benefit our own research, and hopefully also help out with the replication crisis a little bit. So hopefully let's all be more ethical and conscientious researchers and move our field forward. And I will end on these two questions um, and then open the floor up to um, discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. That was that was wonderful. Um, yeah, really, really um, clearly laid out. And uh, really appreciate that. Um, Pam had to sign off, but she uh, she asked me to pass along uh, just her incredible thanks for coming and sharing this with the group and and um, you know how important it is mentioned how important it is to get this conversation started. So I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you, thank you so much for for coming and doing this. Um, so let's open it up now um, for questions, comments from the group again. Um, feel free to raise your hand or, or type in the chat. It can be something from the talk or something um, kind of in response to, to these questions um, Natasha has posed. We, I see there, yeah, please. Yeah, so I think this was really, really great, Natasha. I feel like it's not an issue that I've really thought about, but I feel like how you described it makes it definitely, I am not a language researcher, but I feel like you laid it out in a way that it is definitely applicable to like most research areas. Um, hand, I'm gonna lower my hand really quickly. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess uh, just thinking about the relevance that this term would have for my research, I feel like it, what you said about um, native speaker being too vague and too broad anyways, I feel like really resonated with me. And I, it made me think about covariates really in general. And when you're including a covariate in your model, is it because that's, you know, for example, like race and ethnicity in neuroimaging data, are you like, you're not including that because you actually think that there are like biological differences in the brain, you're using it as a proxy for social context, but it's not as specific as what you could be using. So I feel like you're, that really resonated with me. So I feel like, um, yeah, thank you. I think that's a great example, actually. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know that that was used in neuroimaging. So cool. Well, good to learn. Thank you. <laughs> Something else? Mm -hmm. Others with comments about how this is relevant to their research or, um, you know, kind of comments on the proposed solutions? Oh yeah, please, Julie. Um, I just wondered if you had looked at the pre-screening questions used by the psych subject pool and whether how they align with the way that your recommendations about nativeness. I think I'm the only one. Does linguistics use Sona Savi? No, okay. So you don't I'm have the only access to it, yeah. Okay. So I actually have not used Sona for my own research. Um, I've used it like given my hours to other researchers. So I have not looked at it, um, but I can imagine I've done research on prolific and that is self-identified participants uh, identify whether or not they speak one or more languages. They indicate how many languages they speak. Um, and then, um, but I'm not really sure. So fluent is a very loose term, but it is it, right. So it is self-identified. Um, and so I assume that the, this, it would be similar for Sona. And so these aren't a great way again to um, address this, right? So Sona is not helping us move this forward. Um, and the way that a lot of these recruitment sites uh, they're still using the term native speaker. Yeah, well, with prolific, you may be stuck, although there may be a way to make some progress there. But it seems like with the psych subject pool, there would be an opportunity to impact what those questions are. Yeah, I think that that's actually a really great idea is maybe a summer project is petition to have them change the questions in some way. Um, because they already have like a large swath of questions. Um, and I think you have to. Okay, so Sona has a question, which language are you most fluent in? So that's at least better. Um, but again, and that doesn't get into some of the distinctions of like uh, production versus comprehension and things like that. So Natasha, I was wondering if you could comment on some other terminology. I know that was also in some of the um, um, yeah, papers mm -hmm. that we posted, a terminology like, like L1, L2, LX. I, um, one of your slides made me think of like English as a second language, like that sort of phrasing and terminology that's used. Could, uh, could you talk about that kind of in in connection with what you presented here regarding the native speaker terminology? Yeah, so I think um, L1 and L2 was a, uh, the first step away from this and then LX was kind of an even further step away, um, but they also L1 and L2 definitely still have this kind of like this is the one you learned first and it doesn't take into account that some people live uh, grow up in a mono or in a multilingual environment right so for example I grew up uh, speaking English at school but Dutch at home and so what what's my L1 how can I right I learned both at the same time how do I have just one L1 and so that we get into issues immediately there um, with LX that's a little better but we still can run into these issues of like um, it doesn't measure things like how your usage like so the input and the output that you've gotten um, kind of like uh, how has your proficiency changed over time? Are you now in a context where one of your languages is used more than the other? 
So we're still trying to move even further than that. And I think Sabi probably has more comments. Well, just to like sum up what you said, I think like what we learned from that, like reading about that was that we can't just like replace native speaker with like another easy thing. Like, oh, let's just do L1 instead. Um, it's that these complexities still remain. Like we're not gonna be able to get rid of that. So I think that's like what, like that was like my takeaway from, from that reading. If that may, I don't know if that addressed the question, but that's so, sort of what I learned. I was like, oh no, I have to still ask all my questions that I ask my participants. Yeah, that was my impression that like, uh, like you said, Natasha, L1 was better, but I actually had that same thought. It's like, could you have two L1s? Like, what if you grow up bilingual then? Could you have two L1s? And that was one of like my pressing kind of thoughts about, you know, about reading this. And I, I'm of course not, not a language researcher, but just thinking about other ways to um, measure this in, in my studies, if I'm using like English prompts or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, it seems like we have some good comments in the chat as well. Yeah, I just saw, um... Frederick's comment, um, can you point to any examples of how inconsistency in defining participants' linguistic ability has led to non-replication? Um, no, I don't have any specific examples of it. It's hard to say, oh, uh, this isn't replicable because you use the term native speaker, right? Uh, so that's a little difficult, um, Sabi. I can give one example that hasn't done, it hasn't been part of like the, like, people haven't done a meta-analysis on this, but this was brought up when we, we presented to the psycholinguistics group, which is all these like bilingual advantage papers, right? Which is like a whole quagmire of a, of a situation. Um, but a lot of times we'll see, well, we didn't find it, but it's because they weren't the right type of bilingual. And so this is where, <laughs> so that, 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 that's already an area where there's like a, a rep, like replication issues and, and publication bias and other issues for a complex set of reasons. But then sometimes the way that people try to explain those away is because of the particular language profiles of the participants. So it's like sort of an, an indirect direct example, I think, of this. Yeah. Um, and and that's one that, um, you know, it's, it feels like it's a moving target, like who gets counted as a bilingual, which also the people who have studied that have been like, oh, we have to have a gradient notion of, of bilingualism too. Um, anyway, so yeah, I don't know if that is helpful, but that's like, for me, the most concrete example I know about. And then Sonia says, Qualtrics has question libraries. I believe it's possible to share these UM wide if your team was inclined to give other research easy access. Yeah, I think absolutely, right? Like we don't wanna just like hoard this to ourselves. We'd be happy to share it. So um, that could go on our like next steps after we finish the publication um, is uh, get feedback on the, the questions that we have and if they are suitable um, then to suggest them to the UM uh, SONA libraries and add them. I think uh, someone who's more familiar with Sona, do you have to pay if you want extra questions to screen your participants? I see Adrian nodding. Yeah, yeah last, last time I did it, which was a couple years ago, um, within the department, at least there's like some base questions. And then if you want additional questions, it's, it's um, a little bit extra. I think it's mainly for like the programming time. I want to say it's like, as of a couple of years ago, it was like $20 or something like that. Um, so yes, it is something, but um, I, I imagine there's, there's ways to support okay. your work. Okay. Yeah. So we might have to check and see uh, if, Say, for example, are you a native English speaker is one of those baseline free questions that maybe we can petition like, hey, instead of using this terrible question, here's like a bunch of other ones. Maybe you can select one of these as your free baseline question. And if you want another aspect or another question like this, then you have to pay. Um, well, we'll have to see, right? I feel like anytime we talk with administration, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. So, um, and then... Wendy mentioned, I feel like definitions of L2 versus L1 bilingual and speakers center opens a whole can of words. Yes, it does. Um, we did discuss this in the class and actually the last slides of my presentation is the entire reading list from the class. And so when I share this, you'll have that. Um, and one of the sections we talked about 
Um, so we have like ratio linguistic, we have maturation acquisition, switch dominance, I think would probably be um, the most, and then also high contact languages. So kind of like when languages are in contact and like, yeah. yeah. This, I don't know exactly what your um, kind of plans are for the paper, but an idea to kind of be, be helpful to you on that front that I think resonates a little bit with um, what what Frederick asked. I, I, I don't do language research, but I do focus on individuals in my research. So I, I think about how to make these claims that kind of resonate with what you were saying at the beginning that, you know, averages aren't good descriptions of, of, of individuals. And um, one thing that has kind of worked for me and been compelling, and I don't know if you have empirical data that would, that would allow you to do this, but is just taking something like a group that someone might define as like the native speakers and do your study comparisons and then employ some of your own approaches. Well, let's, let's, what do we actually mean? What's the construct we actually mean? You know, and let's look at that, how that in that same group of people is continuously related to these outcomes. Do you find something? If you can show scientists that by disambiguating their constructs, they actually will get more significant results, <laughs> you, you can win them over even on that front. You know, so it's like, a, not only should you do this, but it's of benefit to you. Um, so, so maybe some idea of that, how you could, um, as an illustration, you know, show the problem, then show how in your own data set you would solve it and what you learned from that, whether it's significant or not, just that you got more nuance, you, you saw some things that did matter or didn't matter um, when looking at these things continuously. That's, that's just one idea if you wanted to like add a little empirical kind of bit to that paper, just because I've had, um, that's, I found that that resonates with audiences in some of my own work in talking about group, group effects or not. I feel like also potentially showing like distributions of your like variables of interest across native versus non-native and show that there's probably overlap between the two. If you haven't already done that, I feel like would be a meaningful way to say it's not, you know, not necessarily the most meaningful way to do that. Rick. Looks like good, Rick. Yeah. Hey, Natasha. Um, so thanks for that. It was really interesting. I've got a half-baked idea that um, maybe could um, be of some use in the paper. One way I was trying to understand what you were saying is to, is to kind of compare and contrast it to what goes on in aging research, right? Where there, there's, a, um, there's a clear continuous variable there. How long have you been alive? <laughs> you know, which can be... <clears throat> measured with some confidence. Um, but there's also, you know, old versus young. Uh, of course, nobody really believes that there's something called a, a, an old person or a young person. It's, you know, and, and so I think most of the analyses treat things in a continuous way, but you still see dichotomous graphs all the time. Um, and is that a problem? I, I don't know. Um, you know, the dichotomous graphs are, easy ways to communicate trends, even if your, you know, your analyses are actually continuous. Um, there's also a kind of deficit model that probably shows up in a lot of that work, you know, it's, um, but it also goes, you know, both ways in terms of so-called advantages. It's not always the case that, you know, young ends up um, outperforming old. Anyway, it, it, it might be an interesting kind of, you know, other sort of case study that has some similarities, but some sharp differences, right? Because age is like a clear, clear thing. Um, how long you've been speaking a language and when you started is certainly a little more objective than something like native speaker, but it's also much harder to assess than age. So anyway, I, it might be interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, it might be interesting to think through those uh, similarities and differences, and, and it could help sharpen some of the conclusions. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that would be beneficial, especially when we're trying to reach like a larger audience as opposed to like, I think we came from a linguistics perspective and uh, now we're trying to, the paper is for psycholinguistics and then bringing this talk to psychology. So it's helpful to be able to have these examples that uh, are more general and a little bit not just in our little niche field. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and kind of related to that, some of the like statistical backing for those approaches too is just a continuous model has more statistical power than a categorical one. Um, and so again, if if you want to find an effect, you have better chances in a, in a continuous model. And you know, you you mentioned things linearly, but if you have continuous data, that means you can also look at nonlinearities, right? There there could be there could be different patterns of a relationship that that you're even if you group or do some sort of extreme groups design that, that can be obscured so those are just some kind of basic thoughts kind of you know um related to to what rick pointed out in grouping versus not Did I miss any? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask Please. if I missed any comments in the chat. Um, was there anything that um, someone wanted me to talk about or address that I missed? It seems like some kind of comments um, or conversation related to things that you've already addressed. So I don't, I don't think anything was missed there. Um, yeah, thank you for the offer to share. Uh, I've had some folks privately message me that yes, they would love to see the slides and the reading lists and that sort of thing. And if you're comfortable with it, I can mm. post it on the Methods Hour website along with along with our video of today's talk. And so hopefully that's also useful to you that you can refer people to these resources to kind of help, um, you know, help facilitate your own work. That'd be We're, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, we're coming up on one o'clock here. Any closing, any closing questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, looks like Kevin has one. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, hi, Natasha. I, I had a, a question similar to um, in this in the similar context of aggregating data. Uh, what happens when you uh, administer your study in, in multiple languages? And then you try to um, aggregate or or, um, or or just do statistics on the phenomenon. Is, is it just enough? Is it enough to like include language um, of the study as a covariate, or are there other considerations that we should th think about? I'm going to defer to Savi on that one. Yeah. So this is part of my research. This very exciting question, and I think it depends on what you're looking at. So um, I one of my grad students is doing like. A study and they did two types of analyses one where they included language as a covariate and another where they included the specific the specific like patterns the typological patterns that they thought were relevant so basically it was like oh you know do we minimize like dependencies like you know in sentences or whatever right and and how does this vary across languages but actually we can ask is it about language or is it about like these other properties that happen to be more common in some languages versus others. And they found like a better model was looking at it, not based on language as a covariate, but based on these other factors that might matter more. So that was like, I think a really exciting finding and people who are looking at, you know, approach it like, you know, sort of trying to compare across languages or across groups of speakers with similar things, we have to think about is it like about language experience or is it about being in this language that matters or is it about like the particular sort of structural properties of that language that matter? So I think it sort of depends on what your causal model is. But I think that's also part of the point that we wanna like highlight is that we, if we don't have a clear causal model of what we think is going on that can make our analyses, then we sort of can default to like this language versus this language as opposed to no, it, it matters if I'm a more like flexible language or if I don't use my, you know, don't use pronouns or whatever other, you know, things might actually be going on.
I don't know if that answered your question, but I got excited because like, this is something that we're like just really thinking about in my lab. Yeah. No, definitely. Thanks for, thanks for your response. It's uh, interesting to, to think about. Anyone else? Okay, it looks like that that's it. I just wanna thank you again so much for, for doing this, for being willing to share your resources. Um, yeah, just, just wonderful, just wonderful to have you. Thank you for the great conversation. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so, so much. This was so yeah. great, thank you. Took, I yeah. took a lot of notes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, our, our absolute pleasure. I think folks from 